Are you ready? Because we're going to talk about learning, memory, and intelligence. So let's talk about memory. We need memory to be who we are. Your memories of past experiences color your experience of the present moment, right? If you are excited uh, about this lecture, it might be because you had fun in previous lectures, so you have expectations, right? If you're feeling bored and you're like, this is going to be another wasted hour of my life, it's because your past experiences have colored that, right? Who you are is based off of your memories. You're remembering your past experiences or even things that are happening recently, right? If the words that I just said you could not recall, you wouldn't be able to have a full understanding of this sentence. So memory is very important. It allows us to exist and think and process things, plan for the future, uh, and solve problems in the present moment. So we don't often think about classical conditioning as a type of memory, but it is. It is a memory of association between two things, right? So if you remember Pavlov and his dogs, uh, dogs, when they hear a bell sound, don't start salivating. But what ended up happening was over time, uh, as Ivan Pavlov was studying these dogs, he would ring the bell uh, and they would associate the sound of the bell with food. Food makes us salivate, but bells don't. But because the bell became associated with that, uh, with the presence of food, now the mind knows that if I hear a bell, more than likely food is going to be there. So that association is uh, related to Pavlovian conditioning. So we have the uh, unconditioned stimulus and response. The unconditioned part means that it's unlearned, it's automatic. So if I put some food into your mouth, uh, here comes the airplane, bzz, bzz, that's what airplanes sound like. Uh, then, uh, by the way, if you're using headphones and here, uh, here comes the airplane, bzz, bzz. there you go, ASMR. Uh, you didn't have to pay me $50 for my uh, Patreon for that. Uh, so free ASMR just for you, just because I care. Uh, so, but uh, when food is put on your tongue, you salivate. It's an automatic thing. You don't have to think about it. It's unlearned. Uh, but now, if you hear an airplane sound, that is a conditioned stimulus. So you learned it, and it creates a conditioned response, which is salivation. Originally, the bzz, bzz of the airplane, right, was neutral. Uh, but now... Uh, it becomes a conditioned stimulus because you learned to associate it with salivation. Then we also have instrumental conditioning or operant conditioning, where we learn from reinforcement or punishment. Reinforcement tells us to do more of something. Punishment tells us to do less of something. So let's say I record this lecture and one of you emails me and says, oh, Professor Thompson, I loved that lecture. I love all your little side tangents. I love the fact that you say um all the time. It makes you sound so human. I'm going to do that more. Uh, now, if a student goes, Professor Thompson, your lectures are too long. You say um all the time and I hate it. And I'm going to write a letter to your dean uh, and uh, she'll give you what's what. Uh, then I'm less likely to do that in the future. Uh, please don't email my dean. Please don't complain about these lectures. It's a stressful time. I'm going to say um sometimes. Uh, there you go, haters. Uh, so reinforcement tells you to do something more. Punishment tells you to do something less. Uh, reinforcement can also, or uh, reinforcement and punishment can also be positive or negative, or there could just be a cat meowing in the background. Uh, so 
if it's positive, that means that something is added and that's causing the reinforcement. Uh, if something is negative, then something is being taken away and that's what's causing the reinforcement or the punishment. So let's say uh, I uh, get you guys uh, say, hey, uh, you're doing such a great job, right? That's praise. You're adding something, meaning I'm going to do more of that in the future. If you uh, say uh, you're doing a terrible job, that's positive punishment right? Uh, I feel bad. and I might do less of what I was doing in the future. Now, sometimes uh, what happens is something is taken away and that causes your behavior to decrease. So let's say you do complain to my dean and uh, she says, well, you know, uh, Jeff, you didn't do a great job, so we're going to need to dock your pay. And I'm like, oh, man, that sucks, right? So I'm losing money. Money is being taken away from me. So I'm less likely to do that in the future. Sometimes taking something away is going to reinforce a behavior. So uh, normally I have to uh, do a, I don't know, uh, um, as a requirement of my job, I have to do uh, 10 push-ups every time I record a lecture. Uh, but because I've done such a great job, my dean's like, don't worry about the push-ups. It's fine. No big deal, right? She's taking away something that I don't like, which is increasing my behavior. So that is a negative reinforcement. Something is being taken away, which increases a behavior. So whenever a behavior is increased, right, that is a reinforcement. Whenever a behavior decreases, that is a punishment. The thing that changes to cause the behavior to change, right? Uh, so not the actual behavior increasing or decreasing, but the thing that causes that change makes it positive or negative. So here's an example of classical conditioning. Uh, you have this metronome that's uh, tick-tocking, uh, and it is a neutral stimulus, uh, but it's related to uh, the presence of food, which is an unconditioned stimulus, which causes the unconditioned response, which is salivation, right? That's an automatic response. You don't have to teach a dog to salivate. But the more times a dog hears a metronome while food is being presented, the dog will start to associate the sound of the metronome with the salivation. And here we have instrumental conditioning. So we can see reinforcement, right? The mouse takes the left path. There are fruit loops. In the future, uh, the mouse is going to take the left path because it was that behavior was reinforced. That would be positive reinforcement. But if the mouse takes the left path and it gets shocked, that's pretty lame. The mouse is going to go, I'm not going to go left in the future. I'm going to go right. So what Pavlov was proposing uh, is happening in our brains is that usually the unconditioned stimulus elicits a response uh, in the area responsible for the unconditioned response. But what ends up happening is over time, the conditioned stimulus is activated at the same time this pathway is activated. So what will happen over time is eventually the activation here will trigger this pathway. So the conditioned stimulus just ends up following the same path as this previously existing neuronal pathway. So let's say you were looking at your computer, right, or your phone, and you were able to find the little bit of your computer or phone where a specific bit of information is stored, right? Maybe it's uh, your family photos from a recent vacation. If you cut out that uh, piece of the chip uh, and you just got rid of it, right, uh, then all those memories, all that data would be gone because you're cutting out the specific thing that's holding that. 
our brains don't actually work that way. Uh, so Lashley was searching for uh, the engram, which would be a physical representation of some learned information, right? Uh, there, the idea was that in the brain, you should be able to point to a specific place where the thing that you just learned now exists. Uh, so there should be some connection between brain areas that allow us to go, okay, this is uh, when I learned how to ride a bike, right? This is the learned my bike part of the brain. So the, his hypothesis was that if you sever uh, this connection, then the memory would be lost. But that's not actually how our brain works. So learning and memory aren't just tied to one specific cortical area. It's actually the action of the entire cortices or multiple cortices that are responsible for specific behaviors that are learned or specific act, uh, um, uh, actions uh, that we might engage in. So this is referred to as uh, equipotentiality, right? Uh, so everything is... Uh, responsible for all kind of our actions. So especially when it comes to learning, it's not just one part of our brain that's active. All parts of our brain are active as we're learning. So uh, the more of a, the more mass you have in a cortex uh, or your cortices, the better it's going to be because you have more that can be involved in learning that uh, function. So you can't just look at one bit of the brain and say, this is the part of the brain that's solely responsible for this. There is, uh, there are parts of the brain that specialize in specific things, but we can't just explain functions based off of one part of the brain. Obviously, it wouldn't be science if we weren't doing mean things to rats, so... Uh, this is a view of a rat's brain uh, and the different cuts that Lashley made to the rat to see how it affected their behavior. So Lashley had some faulty assumptions. Uh, so you uh, don't want to just look at one part of the brain to understand its functions. And uh, we can't just assume that all types of learning are the same. So uh, ac uh, acquiring new memories uh, versus classical conditioning versus operant conditioning, they're not all the same thing in the brain. So we really have to understand that no one function in the brain can be explained simply. The more you learn about things, uh, as you've probably experienced in this class, you might have learned a few things about how the brain works from uh, a chapter in Psych 101, but uh, we've gotten real deep in some of the things that you have originally been taught. You go, oh, it's way more complicated than that. Uh, so really, the brain is much more complicated than even the best scientist in the world right now can fully comprehend and understand. But that's what makes it fun. There's always more to learn about the brain. So Richard F. Thompson and colleagues, uh, by the way, no relation, uh, they suggested that classical conditioning uh, might be located in the cerebellum, not the cortex. Uh, so they looked at the lateral in, uh, interpositus nucleus, uh, which is in the cerebellum, as central for learning. Uh, so you, uh, they would see that responses would increase as learning proceeds. Now, uh, changes in the brain area don't necessarily mean that learning took place in the area. So that's a difficult thing when we're doing brain mapping. Uh, we can see activity, uh, which means that the uh, brain is active in a certain activity, but knowing specifically uh, what that activity means is sometimes hard to understand. So there are limitations in observing the brain. But 
uh, they studied rabbits, not rats. They did rabbits this time. Uh, and they were able to find that learning does occur in the lateral and positive nucleus. Uh, so they were able to find some cells and neurotransmitters that were responsible for changes in the LIP. And when they did uh, PET scans on young adults, they were able to understand that the cerebellum is critical for classical conditioning, but it only occurs if the... Uh, so remember we have like the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. If uh, there's too long of a gap between these two, uh, then the cerebellum won't help with that. It has to be pretty immediate. So here, we just want to focus on the lateral and positive nucleus and the red nucleus. If this uh, area, the lateral and positive nucleus, were deactivated, then learning would stop. Uh, so that would mean that uh, this is responsible for the classical conditioning. But if uh, we interrupted the red nucleus, if a behavior had been learned, then the response to that behavior would be affected. Uh, so this is going from the conditioned stimulus to the conditioned response, right? Uh, so we can actually see that there are specific parts of the brain responsible for this specific uh, classically conditioned pattern. So again, there are different types of learning. There are different types of memory. We tend to think of memory uh, by we, I mean the uninitiated. So sometimes we think of memory as all just one thing, right? But uh, Hebb in 1949 uh, differentiated short-term from long-term memory. Uh, so short-term memory are things that have just occurred. Uh, so the things that I just said recently, long-term memory, things that are further back. Uh, so maybe today you saw an email from me and you remember what that email said. Or you remember the first day of class and you remember what I said on that first day of class, right? Those would be uh, long-term memories. So let's talk about some of the differences between short and long-term memory. Short-term memory has a limited capacity. Long-term memory is basically unlimited. Uh, there is no limit to the amount of long-term memories that you can hold. Short-term memory tends to fade quickly without rehearsal. So if I said 74731.89 and I asked you to remember those numbers, uh, you might have a hard time unless you went 74. 73189, were those numbers? 7473189, 7473189, right? Uh, so you need rehearsal to hold on to a short term memory. Long term memories, uh, you don't need rehearsal because it's stuck in there. So if I said, You are my fire, you would say, The one desire believe right uh it's automatic there's no there's no rehearsal needed it's just stuck in there for the rest of your lives uh 20 years later you'll still know the lyrics to all of those songs uh so uh long-term memories can be stimulated with a cue or hint uh that is what's called a retrieval cue so uh if i asked you something like oh uh did you ever have a really embarrassing thing happened to you in the uh, third grade, you start going through your third grade memories uh, and that cue helps you retrieve that memory. Short-term memories don't work that way. So uh, the original proposition was that uh, short-term memory leads into long-term memory. So we take in information, we rehearse it over and over, and then it consolidates itself into long-term memory. But then as we learned more and more, that distinction between the two started to weaken uh, because there are some things that you hold on to for a short period of time and you rehearse and you rehearse and you remember them for the time that you need to remember them and then they're gone. They're not encoded into long-term memory. 
and also for some things the time that it takes to consolidate those memories into long-term memory is going to vary so memorizing things for this class might be pretty easy for some of you while mem uh, memorizing things for your math class might not be as easy so the same amount of time spent rehearsing something doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the same uh, uh, impact on long-term memory. It doesn't necessarily guarantee that it will be encoded and stored for a long period of time. So consolidation, just like everything else, is much more of a complicated process than uh, you think it is because we always introduce the basic version and we're, we go, well, actually, it's not actually blah, 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 right? So uh, emotion affects your ability to encode uh, and consolidate memories. Uh, more emotionally significant memories are going to stay around longer. They're going to be easier for you to recall. So if you uh, have a normal day of class and it's a pretty boring class, you might remember some of the material. If the teacher says something that really upsets you, you're going to have an easier time remembering it. Or if uh, they say something super funny, right? And they're like, oh, that joke uh, that they made makes me remember uh, how the amygdala is just like Princess Amidala uh, because uh, you know, Anakin was very emotional uh, around Amidala, Amygdala, right? And you're like, oh, that's weird and funny and it made me laugh, so I'm going to remember it. So, the locus uh, coeruleus uh, increases the release of norepinephrine. Uh, emotions cause the release of epinephrine and cortisol, and they activate our amygdala and our hippocampus, and that enhances our consolidation of recent experiences into long-term memory. We should also mention uh, working memory. So working memory is a different way of thinking about short-term memory. It was proposed by uh, Baddeley and Hitch as an alternative to short-term memory. So working memory isn't just the idea that we store things temporarily until it goes into long-term memory, but it's the idea that we use this information that we're storing in the short term to make something happen, right? So let's say uh, I have uh, two things in my shopping cart. One thing is $20, the other thing is $15. So I'm like, oh, how much is this going to cost? Uh, so uh, 10, uh, or sorry, 20 plus 15 is 35. Oh, yeah, and then tax. So let's just say like 10%. So it's going to be like 3850 How much cash do I have on me? Uh, or do I have to use my card, right? That working memory, uh, I have in my mind kind of uh, the numbers, the 20, the 15, the 10 percent, and I do that math quickly using my working memory. I don't need to store that into long-term memory. It doesn't, two years later, I'm not going to go, oh, how much should I spend at the store? Oh, 38.50. Uh, so, no, uh, it's just to actively work on current problems. So when we're measuring working memory, the most common test is a delayed response task, where I give you information and then you have to respond to that information later. Uh, so for example, I might say, or I might just show you this image. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, and then you look at it and uh, just say, look at this image for 10 seconds, right? And then uh, I let some time pass, maybe two minutes, and then I say, draw the shape that was in the upper right corner. And then you would hopefully draw, what was it, a star? Oh man, how's my working memory going? Uh, so, uh, or I might have you draw what was in the uh, lower right corner, right? So that would be short-term or working memory. Now, when you experience damage to your prefrontal cortex, right, this area right here, uh, then that tends to impair your performance. So it seems that our prefrontal cortex is responsible for our working memory.
So amnesia is memory loss. You are probably familiar with the term. And different kinds of brain damage are going to result in different kinds of amnesia. There are related disorders. So we have Korsakoff syndrome, which you might remember uh, is usually related to people who are drinking heavily and are deficient in thiamine or vitamin B1. And that makes it much harder for them to uh, create new memories. So it's causing uh, memory deficiencies. We also have Alzheimer's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disease uh, where you see uh, loss of uh, access to memories, uh, mental confusion, etc. So Korsakoff's, again, uh, prolonged thiamine deficiency. So without thiamine, our brain cannot metabolize glucose. Uh, which we need. It is the power, uh, power giving substance of our brain. I almost said powerhouse, and I was like, that doesn't seem right. Uh, but it is the gasoline for the car that is our brain. There we go. That sounds better. Uh, so, uh, thiamine deficiency can lead to a loss of uh, neurons in the brain or shrinkage of the brain. This is often due to chronic alcoholism. Uh, so some people get all their calories from alcohol because they're drinking all the time. And so they don't get a well-balanced uh, meal and they're lacking in nutrition. So the lack of thiamine leads to Korsakoff syndrome. One distinct symptom is uh, confabulation. So instead, so usually, right, we have a memory of I woke up today uh, I went to the store, right? And there were things that happened in between that. Uh, and we will remember those things. I woke up, oh, and then I had like a whole bunch of texts. So I kind of stayed in bed for a little bit uh, to check up on my texts. And then I got up, uh, I when I woke up, uh, my roommate was uh, cleaning, uh, so I had to like step around uh, her. Uh, and then um, and, uh, there was, um, uh, cookies. There were cookies in the living room, right? Uh, so that's what actually happened. But if I'm having gaps in memory, I might fill in those gaps. So I'm creating memories to fill in the gaps of my memory. Uh, so that would be uh, confabulation. Also, you might see apathy. So not really having any emotional response to things, confusion and memory loss. Then we have Alzheimer's disease, which is a gradual progressive loss of memory, usually occurring in old age. Uh, so uh, for some of you <laughs> young yins out there, you might be like, old age, like when you're 40, get out of here, get out of here with that. Uh, so we're talking about people in retirement age, 65 to 74 or older, right? So 5% uh, of people uh, between the ages of 65 and 74 are going to get Alzheimer's. Uh, uh, but when you're over the age of 85, it goes up to about 50%. Early onset uh, Alzheimer's, so when you're seeing in your 40s and your 50s, that seems to have a genetic basis. Uh, but when it comes to late onset Alzheimer's, there doesn't seem to be a genetic uh, basis to it. There's no drug that currently is affected at treating it. You can slow down the progression of it, but unfortunately it is generative and we haven't cured it. Uh, and the thing is our bodies are only meant to last for so long. At, over time, uh, they degenerate, right? Uh, if you have a car that has been around for a long time, you know this, you replace so many parts, uh, but after a certain point, the car just cannot be fixed anymore, right? Uh, so our bodies are similar. Uh, you know, you get a hip replacement, uh, you get a new kidney, uh, you take medications, but over time, something is going to fall apart. Uh, and sometimes it's our brain, sometimes it's our heart, right? Uh, so sorry to be so uplifting and positive. We all die. Yay. Yay.
So we can see here a healthy brain and here we have an Alzheimer's brain. So we can see how it's degenerating, right? Uh, when you compare the two brains, you can see these areas that uh, look different. Uh, so we uh, just have to understand that the brain isn't meant to last forever. Uh, and over time, something is going to get you, right? Uh, could be a pancreas, could be your brain, uh, it could be your bones. Uh, our, 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 these little flesh cages of ours are temporary. Uh, so, um, but f fun, fun fact, uh, no, I have nothing uplifting and positive. We all die sometimes, guys, and that's just a, a truth of the world. Uh, I'm probably going to break down crying by the end of this uh, slide, so get your tissues ready. So, you know, some of us maybe have experienced uh, family members going through Alzheimer's. Uh, I do actually have uh, one helpful thing. Uh, there are things that you can do. Uh, people who continue to stay active into their uh, adulthood uh, tend to uh, do better overall. It is a case of use it or lose it. So if you are uh, staying at home, uh, and in your retirement and all you're doing is watching TV uh, and, you know, sitting uh, on your porch and yelling at the neighborhood kids and you're not really challenging yourself, right, then you're more likely to develop Alzheimer's. People who stay mentally engaged, if you force your brain to be active, uh, that's a preventative measure. Um, and again, it's preventative, but it's not a cure, right? It's not going to stop it. Uh, all we can do is all we can do. Uh, so let's talk about some of these proteins involved with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so what ends up happening is uh, these proteins accumulate and clump. Uh, so we have the amyloid beta protein, and it creates these plaques from uh, damaged axons and dendrites, uh, and this will create Widespread, uh, widespread atrophy, uh, sorry, widespread atrophy of parts of the cerebral cortex, your hippocampus, and other areas. So basically what's happening is you have all this dead stuff that's just gunking up the works, right? And all that dead stuff is going to cause uh, decay in the parts where it stays around. Uh, you can also have uh, abnormal forms of the tau protein, which create these uh, tangles, uh, and they're part of your intracellular support system of neurons. So we're seeing uh, just all this gunk that's messing with the structure of the brain. So here we have a healthy neuron, uh, and then here we see the degeneration of a neuron over time due to Alzheimer's. So these connections are dying, right? It's shriveling up. Uh, it, you can tell uh, that there's a severe uh, decrease in the neuronal mass. So here we see some healthy brain tissue. Right here we see a little plaque. Uh, over here we see a tangle. Uh, so, yeah, you can see structurally how, uh, like, this is what your brain should look like. This is not what your brain should look like. So this isn't a disorder, but it is a thing that we have all experienced. It's called infant amnesia or infantile amnesia. We don't remember things from the first two years of our life. Uh, and if you do, congrats, you're weird. Uh, but we really don't remember much, right? Uh, none of us go, oh man, I remember being born. Oh, that was so stressful. My shoulder got stuck. And then there are all these doctors and they were all looking at me and going like, this kid's going to be something. And then I sang. Uh, so that's the Disney musical version of your life. Uh, so the uh but it's a universal experience we all uh 
we all experience uh, this lack of memories from our very early life. Now, we form memories, but it's the question is why we forget them. There are a couple of hypotheses. One is uh, that we don't really have the language and reasoning that we develop uh, later in our lives, so it's harder for us to recall that information. Uh, and also changes in our hippocampus and the growth of new neurons might also hinder our ability to uh, recall those older memories. So let's talk about the hippocampus and the striatum. So different parts of the hippocampus are active during new memory formation and the later recall of that information. Uh, damage to the hippocampus uh, is going to result in amnesia and a lot of what we know about memory has been from patients with very localized brain damage. And that's actually true with a lot of uh, our understandings of how the brain works. Somebody experiences damage to a specific part of the brain and then we see that maybe they're having trouble uh, moving their leg. That's a leg. I don't know why I drew, <laughs> drew a weird leg. Uh, but that's a leg. I don't know. I guess now that's a banana with a peel. I don't know what that's supposed to be. It was supposed to be a leg. Anyway, uh, we see that they experience damage to a part of their brain and they can't move their leg very well. And then we go, oh, that must be responsible for the leg. Uh, or somebody, uh, if you remember like uh, Broca's and like Wernicke's area, right? Uh, damage to those specific areas created Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. So by experiencing damage to specific parts of the brain and seeing what happens as a result, we're better able to understand what parts of, uh, what functions are localized in which parts of the brain. So this study wasn't done with a rat. This uh, was done with an actual person. So uh, there's this person called HM uh, to protect their identity and their hippocampus was removed to prevent epileptic seizures. Uh, but after the removal of the hippocampus, uh, HM had great difficulty forming new long-term memories, but his uh, or their short-term working memory remained intact. So that shows that the hippocampus is integral to the formation of long-term memories. So you might be familiar with this photo. Uh, so here we have our hippocampus, but uh, what you might not notice is that the hippocampus actually kind of loops around the thalamus, giving it a little hug, like, oh, buddy, just a little, it's like a big spoon uh, to the thalamus. Uh, so, yeah, that is, oh, and then you can see uh, when the hypothalamus is removed uh, where it's missing. So that's our hypothalamus. Oh, no, sorry, hippocampus. Uh, I guess my hippocampus wasn't working. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I am very tired, guys. Getting my hippocampus and hypothalamus confused. Wow, that is that is that's fun. We we have fun here. We're, at, we're, at, we're just you and me having a great time. <laughs> there are two types of amnesia. We have anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is the type of amnesia that most people think about when they think about amnesia. That is a loss of old memory. So this is the soap opera. Uh, somebody gets into a car accident and they wake up, but they totally have forgotten who they are. Retrograde amnesia. A way to remember that is if you're wearing clothing that is retro, it's clothing from the past, right? Uh, so you're forgetting your past memories. And terrograde amnesia is a type of uh, amnesia that you'd see in like the movie 54 States with Adam Sandler or Memento, where a person doesn't have the ability to form new memories. So every day they wake up and uh, they cannot remember what happened in the previous day. HM showed both types of amnesia after his surgery.
But HM did still have his working memory. So if he was given a number to remember uh, and he was asked to recall that number 15 minutes later without any distractions, he would be able to recall that memory. Uh, but if he was distracted, uh, the memory would be gone within seconds. So some other issues that HM experienced, he wasn't able to state the correct date or his current age. He would read the same magazine repeatedly without losing interest. He would only be able to recall a few fragments of events from the past. And he had a very hard time recognizing himself in a photo, but he could recognize himself in a mirror. So we can see that the effects of losing the hippocampus were far reaching. So we can break up memory into uh, more categories. So we have semantic memory and episodic memory. These are types of long-term memory. Semantic memory is our memory of facts. So if on the test I ask you what semantic memory is, that is an example of semantic memory, right? Uh, because I'm asking you for specific information. So your knowledge of facts is semantic memory. Episodic memory is your memory of events. So if I ask you on the test, uh, describe where you were and what you were doing when you learned about episodic memory for the first time, that would be an example of episodic memory because you're remembering, oh yeah, I was sitting in my chair and I was uh, doing drugs uh, and then I was like, I'm going to do some drugs and learn about biopsychology, right? That would be episodic memory. So uh, HM had uh, the ability to form some uh, semantic uh, memories, but they were very weak. Uh, and he also had issues uh, with episodic memory because he couldn't recall memories and he had a hard time describing events since his surgery. So here is a memory test for amnesic patients. And basically they would be given these random shapes that don't actually look like the thing. Uh, so this, just in case you're wondering, is not a sunset. This is not a target. You can tell by the fact there aren't good deals on everyday items, right? This is not a finger. So you're really having to exert effort to remember these associations. Now, amnes uh, amnesic patients couldn't remember the given names for these things, but if uh, they called this guy like walkie dude uh, and this uh, dog laying on back waiting for pets and this guy uh, soccer dude, right? Uh, though they'd be able to remember the things that they made up uh, more easily than they'd be able to remember the given titles for things. So uh, making associations uh, with things that are given to you versus things that you create yourself seem to be different uh, but still related functions of memory. So issues with memory are going to impact your ability to imagine the future. Uh, we t will talk about explicit and implicit memory. Explicit memory is memory that uh, requires uh, deliberate recall of information, or it's also referred to as declarative memory. These are things like semantic or episodic memory. Uh, so if I said, hey, when was the last time you went to Burger King, right? That is deliberate recall. Uh, or if I'm like, oh, um, my friend called me uh, precocious. Do you know what that means, right? You're recalling uh, specific information, that is explicit memory. Implicit memory is more automatic. You don't really think of implicit memories as they're happening. So for example, riding a bike, writing letters, you're not thinking about how to write the letter J uh, and then A and then S and then O then N to write your name. I'm just going to assume that your name is Jason, person who's listening to my lecture. Uh, so you're not thinking about each one of those stages. It's automatic, but it's still 
a memory. So uh, implicit memory, as defined by the book, is the ex experience uh, of uh, memory on behavior, even if not recognizing that influence. Uh, classical conditioning is also a form of implicit memory because when you have that fear response to something or whatever response you're having, uh, that conditioned response, the response is automatic. You don't think, ah, that's something that I've learned to be afraid of. Let me just real quickly remember how afraid I'm going. It's automatic, right? Uh, so another patient uh, was, uh, which was not HM, uh, was tested with three nurses. One was friendly, one was neutral, and one was stern. And even though he had issues with uh, uh, making new memories, he still uh, preferred the friendly nurse and avoided the stern nurse. Uh, so uh, the episodic memory wasn't there, but he was still classically conditioned to have a preference. So our procedural memory is a form of implicit memory, and it's related to our motor skills and our habits. So if you have something, uh, so for example, driving a car, riding a bike, uh, writing words, right? Uh, those things are procedural. You don't really think about all the steps of doing them as you're driving. Uh, if you need to brake, you don't think, how do I brake, right? It's just automatic. Your foot goes and does the thing that you want it to do. Uh, so it's a very special kind of implicit memory. Uh, and there were patients uh, with amnesia who still have intact procedural memory. Uh, so they could learn to do things, uh, but they might not have memories of doing those things. So to summarize in what we saw with HM and what we often see, in amnesic patients, uh, they have normal working memory unless they are distracted by something. They have very severe interrograde amnesia for declarative memory. Uh, so they have a very hard time creating new episodic memories and new semantic memories. Uh, they have a very severe loss of episodic memory, so retrograde amnesia. They have better implicit than explicit memory, and they have nearly intact procedural memory. So our theory on the hippocampus is that it is critical for declarative memory functioning, especially the functioning of episodic memory. So uh, it's that time where we talk about research with rats. When they have damage to their hippocampus, uh, they have issues with two different types of tasks, matching to sample and non-matching to sample. These are two very similar tasks. Uh, in the matching to sample, you see an object and then you later have to choose the object that matches. Non-matching to sample is you see an object and then you must later choose the object that is different than all of the rest. So this would be an example of delayed non-matching to sample task. So the uh, there's a triangle box and a circle box. The monkey sees that there is food in the triangle box, but later the food is under the circle box. So the monkey has to learn that the food is under the new object. Finding your way around town, you know, if you're making your way downtown, uh, don't sing the entire song. Or actually, no, just take a break, listen to the song, uh, just wonder, you know, if you could fall into the sky, do you think time would pass you by? Google it, see if there's an answer to that question. Uh, so. Uh, navigation depends on your surroundings and your spatial memory. Any damage to your hippocampus is going to impair your abilities on spatial tasks. So rats, uh, we give them radial mazes where the uh, mazes have the maze will have multiple arms. Uh, so they start here and they can go uh, either here or here or here or here, right? And at the end of one of these paths, 
is a delicious block of cheese. Yeah, rats love cheese. Uh, there's also the uh, Morris water task where a rat needs to swim through murky water. And uh, if they don't find this platform, they will drown. Uh, but there is a little platform just underneath the surface uh, and they'll be able to stand on it and go, oh boy, what a rough day I've had, right? Uh, so having the hippocampus is going to uh, make you able to do those tasks. If you don't have the hippocampus, you're going to have a much harder time with those tasks. Here's a radial maze. As you can guess, if you were starting in the center and you could not remember which paths you went down, you wouldn't go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? That requires planning. You might go uh, down this one and then down this one, then come back and then go back through this one and then come back and go through this one then come back and go through this one, right? Not having your memory intact makes it much harder to plan. So this is the path that the rat took on the first trial. This is the 34th, and this is the 71st. So the first time, it couldn't find the platform. It was on the 34th time that it swam around and was able to find the platform. Then on the 71st trial, it had a much easier time finding the platform. It actually took only six seconds to find the platform. So that shows the hippocampus's effect on our memory. So in our hippocampus, we have specialized cells. Uh, we have place cells that respond to particular spatial locations while looking in a particular direction. And then we have time cells that respond to a particular point in a sequence of time. So if you remember being back in class, uh, there was, I think, what we were on the third floor, right? Uh, so you're on the third floor, you walk into uh, that one door uh, that takes you to the back of a classroom and you're looking forward uh, towards the front uh, of the room. Uh, there are specific place cells that are responding to that. And then you have your time cells. Some of them are responding uh, more to the beginning of class uh, as you're getting settled and pulling your book or notebook or pen out uh, and others are responding to the end of class where you are planning on the thing that you have to do once class is over. Uh, and also our play cells receive input from cells in your uh, torrinal cortex. So these cells in the iterino cortex form a hexagonal grill, uh, not grill, grid. Uh, I'm hungry, I want barbecue, but I can't eat barbecue right now because I have to make a lecture. So uh, the hexagonal grid, uh, these are called grid cells. Uh, and they respond to different sets of locations, but they're always in a hexagon. Uh, so episodic memories are memories that uh, occurred in a particular place with a sequence of events that occurred over time. So last time you were in the kitchen, you were making uh, some cauliflower and you forgot that you had already warmed up uh, the pot. So you grab it uh, by the side and then you burn your hand and you immediately put it under cold water. And then with your other hand, you were Googling what to do with the burn. And you remember looking at your hand and seeing how red it was, but it didn't look like you were blistering. It also didn't seem too bad. And then you remembered smelling uh, your cauliflower burning and then you just went, ah, this is the worst, right? A uh, specific place with a particular sequence of events over time. Any loss of uh, those place cells or those time cells is going to disrupt your memory formation. So here we can see our grids. Here's a small one. I'm going to try to 
draw that one for you. That is a hexagon. Let me try it with a bigger one. Uh, there we go. Look at that nice little hexagon. This is probably going to be a little bit easier. Uh, this is also a great, like, um, to see if you're too drunk to drive. Uh, look, I can make it a little cube now. Wow, so cool. It's a hexagon. Uh, but also, oh, what if I do like this, and then do like that, and then do Voice Red got tired of my shenanigans and cut me off. So I'm going to do this, and that, and that. I'm going to make a bigger one over here. Yeah, so cool. Wow. Whoa. Awesome. Awesome. I'm probably the coolest. I'm the best at drawing. Uh, so we can see these hexagonal grills. Thank you for tolerating me having fun with cells. Our episodic memory, which is dependent on the hippocampus, develops after a single experience, right? You don't have to uh, kiss uh, your crush uh, multiple times to remember kissing your crush, right? The memory happens and then, or the event happens and the memory is formed. A lot of semantic memories are very similar. You learn a new word, you learn the meaning, you understand what the word is. Uh, when it comes to habits or uh, learning uh, kind of like patterns of what will or won't happen under a set of circumstances, that relies on part of the basal ganglia, uh, and that is the striatum, uh, which is your caudate nucleus and your putamen. So an example of our ability to predict things with repeated experience is the question, will it rain today, right? Uh, so if you've never experienced rain before, uh, then you look outside and you're like, oh, I'm not sure, right? Uh, but after multiple experiences with rain, you're like, oh, there's a, there's a chittering in the air and there's a dryness, ah, uh, yes, uh, coldness in my bones. There will be rain today, children. It shall pour, right? Uh, so when uh, you've had exposure to something, the more exposure allows you to make those future predictions. So uh, another example of prediction, right? These are different combinations of these uh, bluish, grayish, and purplish uh, triangles and rectangles. Uh, so if you have all blue, that's yes. If you have all purple, that's no. Blue, purple, blue, yes. Blue, purple, purple, yes. Purple, blue, purple, no. I'm not going to go through all of them, right? Uh, but once you have these new ones, what do you expect is going to happen, right? Uh, is this going to be yes? Is this going to be no? Probably. Who knows? Uh, you, you probably know. You seem smart. I believe in you. Uh, so we're able to, uh, based off of our exposure to multiple things, make these decisions. So there have been studies that uh, suggests a division of labor between the striatum and other parts of the brain, hippocampus, cortices, but more than likely, as we've discussed before, it's all of them working together, right? Uh, so uh, hippocampal learning is uh, more at the beginning of a task. So think about learning how to drive a car, right? Uh, hands at 10 and 2. Uh, make sure you adjust your mirrors. Remember to put on your seatbelt, like the, th the checklist that you go through whenever you're driving for the first time, right? Now, uh, it's become more habitual. You don't think about it, right? Uh, you just sit in the car, you put your hands there, your feet know where to go. You don't need to think about how to back up your car. You just do it, and then you pull out, and then you're driving, right? as things become more habitual or automatic, that's going to lean more on the striatum. So here's a nice little chart to help you compare and contrast the two. 
so we have the hippocampus, uh, which learns through a single exposure. Striatum learns through many exposures. Uh, the hippocampus is more flexible in our response, our striatum. Those are habits, reflexes, right? Uh, the things that you uh, like don't necessarily need to think about. So when it comes to catching a ball, you don't think about like triangulating the location of the ball. It's a habit, it's a quick response. Uh, now, if I'm trying to remember the last time I played catch, I might pick and choose which parts of the story to discuss. Uh, so it's more flexible. Uh, so the hippocampus, uh, there's a little bit of a delay. Um, in, uh, so I'm trying to remember uh, what I know about the hippocampus. So I'm like shuffling through my brain. I'm like, do I mention this? Do I admit? So there's a little bit of delay sometimes. The striatum is prompt and quick, right? When you're driving a car, when you're riding your bike, you don't have time to think about what your body needs to do. So with the hippocampus, we're looking at explicit memories. Striatum, we're looking at implicit memories. Uh, so uh, with the hippocampus, if we see damage there, we're going to see issues with our uh, explicit memory or declarative memory specifically, uh, or sorry, especially episodic memory. Uh, with the striatum, we're going to see that it's hard to remember skills that we've learned. So damage to the striatum, you might be able to remember uh, which strings are uh, named what in a, on a guitar, but will you be able to play it? Probably not, right? Uh, but if you got damage to your hippocampus, you'll have uh, ease with playing the guitar, but trying to remember specific notes uh, or names of things. You might have a, you might like play a song and somebody might go, oh, what's the name of that song? And you might not be able to remember it because your hippocampus has been damaged. So as mentioned before, there are other parts of our brain that contribute to our memory. Our amygdala is associated with our fear learning, so uh, learning that things are scary. Our parietal lobe is associated with piecing things together. Damage to our anterior temporal complex, so the back of the temporal lobe, results in loss of semantic memory, which is called semantic dementia. And then we also have our prefrontal cortex, which is involved in learned behavior and decision making. So when we're trying to understand how memories are formed, we'll see that a pattern of changes occurs uh, in the brain as a memory is being formed. But unfortunately, every change is in a specific memory. So when we try to retrace those steps later, we might go, oh, well, this is how a memory is formed, but next time it might go a completely different way, right? Uh, so trying to understand the intricacies of this process are difficult because when we observe something once, we don't always see it in the same way the next time. So we're trying to understand all the factors that are involved, but in some cases, it's very hard to know. So there's a synapse that we're going to talk about. It's called the Hebbian synapse, and it increases in effectiveness because uh, at the, so we have our little neuron, right? It has its uh, little branches, uh, and they're going, you know, one way or another. Uh, and both at the uh, presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons, uh, we are seeing simultaneous activity. And that simultaneous, uh, simultaneous activity might be critical for associative learning. So two things firing at the same time, right? Uh, because they're firing at the same time, it's reinforcing those pathways. So it's reinforcing that simultaneous firing. Sometimes when we're trying to study learning uh, or anything involving our neurons, we might look at invertebrates uh, because some invertebrates, for example, 
uh, the uh, aplysia. Uh, it's a slug-like invertebrate that has very large neurons, so it's very easy to put them under a microscope because you're like, oh, look at that little guy, right? Uh, I can very easily see what's going on in this poorly drawn neuron. Uh, so we can study things like habituation and sensitization because we can actually see what's happening in that large neuron. Look at this cute little guy. Look at that cute little marine mollusk uh, and its big old, big old neurons. So if you touch a giant marine mollusk, right, uh, the aplysia, it's going to withdraw because it's just going to assume that you're a threat. Uh, but what we can do is we can apply that tactile stimulus while looking at one of its neurons and see that withdrawal response. So we can actually see the pathway that these uh, signals are traveling when we're looking at its cells. So habituation is a decrease in a response to something. Uh, so if I uh, clap at you and I go, hey, right? Uh, and the first time you're like, oh, what is that, right? Uh, but if I do it like every class, right, then you're going to get used to it over time. If I'm doing it multiple times during a class, you're going to start ignoring it because our uh, brains just, once we get used to something, we just don't have as strong a response to it. So uh, this depends on the change in the synapse between uh, the sensory and the motor neurons. Uh, so uh, does that signal pass on? Uh, so you might sense it, but is it going to send the signal onto the motor neurons uh, to have that like response of like, oh, Ooh, I'm scared now. Uh, I'm jumping because somebody just clapped in front of me, right? Uh, so sometimes those sensory neurons are going to fail to excite the motor neurons like they used to. So here we can just see some habituation. So we're getting some response uh, from this body part, which leads to the sensory neuron. And what happens is the sensory neuron is still being stimulated, but there's a release uh, or decreased release of the neurotransmitter, which means that these receptor sites aren't being hit by neurotransmitters. So you're experiencing a lower response at the motor neuron. We also have sensitization, which is when you have a much more intense stimulus. And due to that, uh, the cells, your neurons, are much more responsive to a mild stimulus. So what happens at the synapse is, one, serotonin that's released from a neuron can block po uh, potassium channels in the presynaptic neuron. Or uh, what can happen is, uh, the release of neurotransmitters from a neuron uh, result in prolonged sensitization. So there's more uh, in the synapse that's available, which means that it's more likely that the next neurons will fire again. So long-term potentiation occurs when one or more of the axons leading into a specific neuron uh, are uh, bombarding that neuron with stimulation. So it leaves the synapse potentiated and makes the neuron more responsive to receiving signals. So there are a few properties of long-term potentiation. We have specificity, where only the synapses uh, that have been highly active in response to uh, a, a specific pairing are the ones that get strengthened. Uh, so if we have multiple going in and these two are firing multiple times, right, these two are going to be the ones that are strengthened and this pathway is going to disappear. Uh, we also have 
co uh, cooperativity. So when uh, you have uh, two that are going in, right, uh, to our uh, uh, dendrites, you're going to see that uh, both of them firing at the same time are going to give a stronger response than just one firing multiple times. Also, uh, if you have a weak input and a very strong input, if uh, they are happening at the same time, enough times that pairing is going to mean that eventually this weak response by itself will still get the same response because the weak has been associated with a strong response. So that's associativity. Here's an example of associativity. This weak uh, firing and this strong firing are happening at the same time, meaning that both synapses are strengthened. There is no stimulation here, meaning that this synapse is not strengthened and it probably weakens. Neurons just like us can experience depression. So if, uh, <laughs> if uh, there's a prolonged decrease in response at a synapse, uh, so axons have been less active than others, then that can weaken uh, that synapse, right? Uh, so sometimes strengthening one pathway can weaken another. So let's talk about some of the biochemical mechanisms of long-term potentiation. When we're talking about LTP, you down with LTP? Uh, then we're usually talking about glutamate. There are two types of glutamate receptors. AMPA and NMDA. So here we have glutamate at different receptors. At the AMPA receptor, it will open up a sodium channel so some sodium can come in. With the NMDA receptors, it usually doesn't let anything enter in because our old friend magnesium is blocking the ion channel. So repeated glutamate excitation of AMPA receptors is going to depolarize the membrane. That depolarization, uh, remember that magnesium that was blocking uh, the NMDA receptors, uh, it's going to knock it out. Uh, and that means that those channels are going to be open. So then all those calcium ions that are just hanging out can now enter the neuron. So when calcium enters, hey calcium, uh, boop, boop, uh, that's going to trigger other changes. So it's going to activate some proteins, which set more events in motion. Uh, so that means that more AMPA receptors are going to be built. Uh, ka -ch, ka -ch, ka -ch. Uh, and the branching of dendrites is also going to increase. Those are some real good dendritic branches. And that's going to increase future responsiveness to glutamate. So here we go. Again, the sodium is entering. Uh, if we, we get enough glutamate, then it's going to displace that magnesium, which means that more sodium and more calcium is going to enter. So uh, I see much to polarize and much sodium. And I think that this is like a, a doge meme. Uh, so it's like a little dog. Uh, and this is a little doge. I, I'm not good at drawing dogs, but it's like, wow, uh, much depolarization, much sodium, uh, much calcium, such. Wow. Great. Uh, thank you for letting me waste your time with that. So sometimes changes in the presynaptic neuron can cause a long-term potentiation because of what is called a retrograde transmitter. So just imagine you have your little neuron, right? Uh, man, I'm so good at drawing neurons. Uh, so what can happen is uh, the neurotransmitters are sent that way, but you also have a retrograde transmitter that's sent back. 
and that can cause certain changes. So it can uh, decrease the action potential threshold, making it more likely that this neuron will fire. It can increase neurotransmitter release, so when it fires, it releases more neurotransmitters. It can expand the axon, or it can uh, cause transmitter release from additional sites. So sometimes firing, uh, the firing of a neuron uh, and this retrograde transmitter can increase future firing. So we had the signal go here, right? And let's assume that there was some uh, retrograde transmitter and now a new synapse was added. Wow, wow, that's nature, so beautiful. So when we're seeing long-term potentiation, that means that we're seeing increased activity from the presynaptic neuron and increased responsiveness from the postsynaptic neuron. And this is just one step towards us understanding learning as a process in the brain. So if we were to fully understand the mechanisms that impact long-term potentiation, we might be able to create drugs that help improve our memory. Uh, drugs like caffeine, Ritalin, modafinil uh, uh, can help enhance learning by increasing arousal. So whenever people are looking at me drinking a rock star or a monster, and they're like, that's bad for you, I'm like, um, shut up. It's increasing arousal and making my brain work good and destroying my kidneys. There are some herbs uh, that you might have heard of, for example, ginkgo biloba and others that are supposed to be uh, smart pills or smart herbs that make your brain work better. They have doubtful effects. They haven't really been shown in a lab to be effective. So you can alter genes uh, to affect memory, but with anything, you change one thing and it's going to affect other things. So altering gene expression in mice, uh, you'll see certain benefits to certain types of memory, but they might impair other types of memory. Uh, for example, you can play around with the M uh, NMDA receptors, which is going to increase learning speed, but cause chronic pain, right? So that's kind of a downside. You definitely don't want chronic pain. You might be able to learn faster, but you'll be in pain all the time. That is definitely a downside. But there are ways to improve memory without making you hurt all the time. Studying... M, <laughs> uh, studying, interestingly enough, improves your memory. The more you expose yourself to material, the better you will know it. You watch this lecture once, you'll be kind of familiar with the material. You watch it twice, you take some notes, you review those notes, you look at the textbook, if you have it, uh, you uh, watch a fun video about NMDA receptors, the more exposure you get to it, the more you rehearse that, the more you test yourself, the better your memory is going to be. Also, just in case you didn't know this, good sleep and low stress also improve memory because uh, our brains can only attend to so much at once. The more stressed you are, the harder it is go going to be for you to attend to what you're trying to study. And also, if you are sleep deprived, then your brain's not working at optimum capacity. So you really want to make sure that you're getting good amounts of sleep, you're reducing stress as much as possible, but study, 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 study. How many times do I have to say it? Study! Did I say study? Uh, and I also didn't hit uh, testing yourself as much as I should have, but that is a great way to know how much you know and how much you remember. After this lecture, just try to see what you can recall. So when you're looking at long-term potentiation, right, what two receptors are the ones that are being affected? Okay, I remember NMDA, and then there was the A, AMP, A, 
AMD, AA, YMCA, what was that other one? And then why, which one, I know that one had like the thing blocking it. Was that calcium or magnesium or thiamine? What's thiamine? Is thiamine related to something? That's Korsakoff syndrome, right? Uh, so if that's the way that your memory sounds, then you don't know the material well. But if you're like, no, thiamine is related to Korsakoff syndrome, which is uh, the type of amnesia caused by excessive drinking, the other type of memory damage can call, come from Alzheimer's. Uh, at what age is there a 50% uh, rate of Alzheimer's and what was the age range for the 5%? Uh, I think it was 65 to 74 and then after 85 it's 50% and then there's early onset which has the genetic component to it. Late onset Alzheimer's doesn't, right? So if you can recall things, if you can test yourself, you know what you know. And I'm doing that without looking at my notes, right? I'm just trying to see what my brain can recall. So the more that you can recall, the more you test yourself, the more you know what you actually know. Also, by testing myself, those pathways are being reactivated. What happens when you activate pathways over and over? Long-term potentiation. So by talking about long-term potentiation, not only is it happening, but it's also reinforcing my understanding of long-term potentiation, which is what type of memory? Semantic memory, right? So by talking about these things, by testing myself, I'm reinforcing these things. Now let's talk about intelligence. Intelligence includes learning, memory, reasoning, and problem solving. It is a difficult concept to define because different people show different expressions of intelligence, right? You might be very good at reasoning and problem solving but have a terrible memory. Does that mean that you are less intelligent uh, than somebody who has a great memory but is pretty terrible at reasoning and okay at problem solving, right? So uh, all these different types of intelligence, according to Spearman in 1904, uh, they, pos uh, they positively correlate with one another. So in general, when you see somebody with a very good memory, they're also pretty good at reasoning and pretty good at problem solving, right? So in general, these are all related. So that's when we started getting the idea of general intelligence or G. So if you think about somebody who is athletic, uh, if they're pretty good at basketball, they're probably also pretty good at baseball, right? Uh, if they're good with uh, leg exercises, they're probably good. Uh, so if they're good at squats, they're probably good at deadlifting, right? Uh, now, they might not be as skilled as someone else uh, who's super skilled in that thing, but they're probably more skilled than average than somebody who's terrible at basketball or baseball uh, or uh, squatting or deadlifting, right? Uh, so general intelligence is the idea of this one measure that we can use to describe somebody who's more than likely to excel at all aspects of intelligence. But some people are good at one skill and others are generally good at multiple skills. Hi, Kat. Thank you for interrupting me right at the end of this slide. Uh, well, I'm not gonna re-record it because I've been talking for two whole minutes. Two whole minutes, two whole minutes. Kat, you just have to ruin everything, don't you? Now you don't wanna say anything. You don't, want, you don't want to say anything now? Thank you very much. So, bigger when it comes to brains doesn't always mean better. Uh, so, within the same family, if you're looking at like the same uh, type of, so for example, primates, right? Bigger brains are actually going to correspond with better cognition and thinking, uh, but when, it com when comparing species to species, a bigger brain doesn't necessarily mean a smarter animal. So 
whales that are very large creatures do have bigger brains than we do as humans, but it does not mean that they are smarter. So next time you see a whale, you look at it and feel superior. There's also the body to brain ratio. So we being the most intelligent, the best, the smartest, the most attractive species have large brains in proportion to our body size than do species that are less impressive. I like how they just decided to pick on frogs. Like, yeah, sorry, frogs, you're not impressive. What are you doing? Just riveting all the time. Uh, so certain species, chihuahuas, squirrel monkeys, and marmosets, uh, have a odd body to brain ratio. Uh, I also just appreciate. Sometimes I uh, look at like what textbook uh, um, writers uh, put in, and I'm like, that's that's a fun little fact. Uh, but yeah, human obesity is reducing our body to brain ratio. So uh, yeah, if the textbook authors just uh, weight shamed you. So are you going to take that? Are you going to let the textbook authors weight shame you? Wow. Uh, so, yep, some fun facts there. So what it could be, uh, because there are some animals that beat us in body to brain ratio, and there are also some animals that beat us in total brain size, we might just have more neurons. So whales and elephants have huge brains, but their neurons are larger and more spread out. Marmosets have a greater brain to body ratio than humans, but their bodies are smaller, so they're going to have fewer neurons. So here we can see the relationship of uh, brain mass to body mass across species. Uh, humans and primates are over here, non-primate animals are over here, uh, and we have our uh, amphibians and our fish and our reptiles and our birds. So uh, as you might assume, we have this really nice ratio where our body mass is in this range, uh, but oh, look at all that brain mass that we have. We're killing it. We're really killing it. So uh, give your uh, brain a little kiss and say thank you for being <laughs> large in general and also generally large in proportion to my body but also for having a significant number of neurons. So to look at it differently we can compare ourselves to marmosets, gorillas, elephants, and whales. Whales have a very large brain Marmoset's a very small brain. We're right here in the middle between whale and marmoset. Gorillas, uh, as big and intimidating as they are, have a smaller brain than we do. So the next time you're hanging with a gorilla, feel superior as it grabs you and tosses you around like a rag doll. Uh, brain body ratio, marmosets have the biggest brain body ratio. We're in second place, but gorillas, elephants, and whales are losing out to us. But when it comes to brain neurons, we are really killing it. 86 billion, 33 if you're a gorilla, 23 billion or 21 for elephants and whales, and that dumb little marmoset with 1.2 billion. Next time you hang out with the marmoset, you look at that marmoset and you just feel, just feel good because that is a dumb marmoset. Sorry, marmosets, you lose today. So there is a moderate correlation between brain size and IQ, uh, but it's not a perfect correlation. Intelligence is uh, actually correlated with the surface area of your cortices, especially when looking at your frontal and parietal lobes, as well as the caudate nucleus. Uh, but white matter is important. So not only is it important to see that we have neurons, but the connections among those neurons are what make things so important because those connections are what allow us to have the functions that we do. So men have larger brains uh, than women do in general, but don't jump to conclusions about that because we do have equal IQs. 
Now, one hypothesis for that is that women have more and deeper sulci on the cortices, so uh, inside those folds, right? Uh, so that would mean that there's more surface area. Uh, uh, so even though the brain is smaller, if you were to like uh, <laughs> flatten out the brain and measure all of the surface area of the brain, it would be equal, right? Uh, also, our brains are uh, organized differently, uh, but that keeps our intelligence the same. So there might be some strengths that you see, but on average, uh, if you look at all performance overall, we balance out. Uh, so you cannot just uh, make assumptions about somebody's intelligence just by measuring the size of their brain. That is something that the eugenicists did back in the day where we made, uh, and by we I mean not me for sure, uh, but uh, they would make these measurements of people's skulls and make assumptions about their intelligence and say, well, these people are superior because their skulls look like this. These people are inferior because their skulls look like this. Uh, and that means that they're less evolved. They're closer to animals and we should kill them all. Yay, eugenics. Uh, so definitely we don't want to get anywhere close to that uh, when it comes uh, within species there is not that much uh, that brain size can account for genetics plays a role in intelligence uh, so monozygotic twins are going to have more similar uh, test scores on measures of intelligence than dizygotic twins uh, also, uh, even if monozygotic twins are raised in separate households, they're still going to overall score the same. Uh, heritability of traits increases the older you get. So even though uh, when you're adopted, you might be very similar to your adoptive parents, as you grow older, you become more similar to your biological parents. So at an early age, uh, they, you might see a difference in monozygotic twins that were raised separately, but over time, you will see that they're more similar the older they get. So there is a environmental aspect to intelligence. So if you were raised in impoverished conditions or attended a lower quality school, that can have a negative effect on your intelligence. One big thing is nutrition and uh, access to uh, early like exposure to books and material. Uh, those things can negatively affect your intellectual development. So even though there is a significant heritability of intelligence uh, and genes do play a big role in that, there can be environmental effects and there's no specific gene that is the definitive thing that determines your intelligence. So our brains are very similar to other mammals, especially primates who we are closely related to, but we have very large brains and the issue with having a large brain is they require a lot of energy to maintain, right? Uh, so they are, bra our brains are 2% of our mass, but they take up 20% of our energy. So that is like, uh, that's like the American economic system. Like our brain is like a billionaire and it's just taking up all of the resources. Like, no, 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 we, we need it. It's going to trickle down to the rest of us. But in this case, it actually does. Uh, so uh, also the fact that our lar brains are larger means that our skulls are bigger, meaning that uh, childbirth is a much more difficult process. So it takes us longer to develop, uh, meaning we come out not really ready for the world. If you have seen like a, a three month old uh, cat, like it's walking around and doing stuff, a three month old baby is not walking around and doing stuff. So we have to get out early because at a certain point, we would be too big to come out, right? Uh, so that means that it's much less likely that we're going to have a bunch of us.
So our brains do require more nutrition and more energy, uh, but we have done things that have made it so that we can get more energy. By walking upright, we're saving time and energy. By cooking food, we need a smaller digestive tract because we're having an easier time in digestion. We don't need it to go all the way through all these things and be processed multiple times in order to get the nutrition that we need. By hunting in groups, uh, we are able to maximize uh, uh, what uh, we're able to get and also share resources with one another. Uh, so we also have differences in our glucose transport systems. Uh, we get more to the brain and less to the muscles. Uh, so we uh, are smarter, not stronger, right? You, us versus a bear, that bear cannot do calculus, uh, but it can maul us, right? Uh, we're not going to win in a physical test against the bear, but we can outsmart the bear uh, and then teach it how to ride a unicycle, right? Uh, so by hunting in groups, by using tools and weapons, uh, we've learned to outsmart other things, which means that we get more food, which means that we have more energy for our brains to develop. So we're having fewer babies, but part of that is because they require much more effort, right? A one-year-old cat is an adult, right? It's doing its thing. It doesn't need any help from anybody. A one-year-old baby, like, oh my God, uh, I had this one-year-old coming for a job interview, couldn't speak, could barely walk, wasn't potty trained, had no job skills, right? That was not a baby that I was planning on hiring. So because, uh, you know, uh, when we have babies, they need care until they're 25 or 30 or 35. That's a joke about how terrible our economy is. Uh, <laughs> we, we have to focus on having fewer children because trying to raise 10 children, right? You can't just have a litter of 10 children. You'd go crazy, right? Uh, or you get a TV show. Uh, so we also have a very long lifespan uh, and we, uh, we cooperate with one another, right? Uh, we are social creatures. I don't have to learn how to raise food. I don't know, need to learn how to raise animals. I don't need to learn how to grow my own food. I don't need to actually even learn how to cook it, right? Uh, I can have other people in society do that. And I could just be good at talking about psychology, right? And I will talk about psychology so other people know about psychology. And then people will take care of my car uh, that uh, I drive to work. Uh, or people will drive the train that I take to work, right? By cooperating, we ensure that we all uh, grow. So the social aspect of humanity was very important in our brain's evolution. So that is all uh, for this chapter. Uh, don't forget the importance of studying. Uh, we have a final coming up. I believe in you. Uh, take Take care. Hey, yeah, you. Take care of yourself, okay? Take care. Be well.